uh, Senate Bill 828. Uh, and I will uh, start by uh, thanking the, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you, and thank you to the committee uh, for working with us uh, on, uh, on the bill. Uh, and I do accept uh, the committee's amendments. Uh, and I will uh, note that in addition to the amendments suggested by the committee, the committee suggested uh, various additional avenues of cl clarification and fleshing some things out. Uh, and uh, Mr. Chairman, as you and I discussed when we met yesterday, uh, we will be working with you between now and appropriations uh, on, uh, on those areas. Uh, and one thing that we did discuss is that one of the committee amendments is to reduce the 200% uh, of arena in terms of uh, zoning to 125. Uh, and that is part of flushing these various items out over the next month or so. Uh, the goal would be to increase the 125 back to 150. So we would end up at 150% uh, of the RENA allocation. Uh, so again, thank you for working with us. I think it's kind of solving the, without in, injecting sprawl into the exactly prevent sprawl yes sprawl. I agree we have a shared goal of not inducing sprawl we want infill housing so thank you for working with us mr. chairman uh, colleagues um, the the regional housing needs assessment arena um, uh, could be and should be a powerful for tool uh, for the state to enforce housing law and fair share principles so that all communities are participating in solving our housing crisis um, and the nearly four million home deficit that we have in California. Uh, unfortunately, RENA um, is broken. Uh, and when we did some work last year that touched on RENA across the spectrum, the one thing that pretty much everyone agreed on, whatever their view, was that RENA needed to be fixed. And that's what we want to do with SB 28 which strengthens RENA uh, and makes it more data-driven uh, and less political. Uh, so uh, SB 28 does a few things. Uh, first, it requires the state to do an unmet needs assessment uh, to, and to incorporate uh, the 4 million home, it's actually more like 3.6 million, uh, deficit into RENA. Uh, and also rollover deficits from cycle to cycle. So the communities that are not meeting their RENA, that deficit of course doesn't go away because it has real life implications for real people. Uh, and so it would be rollover. Uh, as mentioned before, it will require communities uh, to zone above 100% of RENA uh, because we know that if you zone exactly at 100% of your RENA allocation, uh, for many reasons, a uh, project may be delayed or may not happen, or a project may get built at less than its full zoning, uh, and so you're setting yourself up never to hit 100%. Uh, and so that's why we put 200%, it's now 125, it may become 150%. Uh, the uh, bill also requires um, uh, the COGS to focus on concentrating growth in high opportunity areas with good public transportation because, as we just discussed, we don't want to induce sprawl. Uh, so in terms of deficits, the state's population forecasts do not take into account historic underproduction of housing, uh, which has been particularly stark over the last few decades. As communities uh, at times stifle housing construction, their population can be limited by how many new homes are built, creating the illusion that population growth is slow or stagnant. It becomes a self-perpetuating cycle. Uh, this illusion can be prevalent even in areas that have thriving job markets and skyrocketing housing demand and explosive prices. There's also no rollover mechanism currently in RENA to ensure that underperforming communities are accountable for their remaining obligation. This creates a perverse incentive for cities to routinely underperform on RENA because the deficit just disappears under current law uh, and uh, their future allocations will probably be reduced because it will look like they're not really growing. Uh, SB 828 will fix this, as I have just described. Um, it will also address zoning, as I've just described, in terms of going above the 100%, and will focus growth in infill areas as opposed uh, to sprawl. I do want to just uh, note some of the true inequities in RENA, and uh, when we received the blanket list of uh, RENA compliance, 
uh, this year from HCD. Uh, it showed, in part, of course, a global list of every city's arena allocation. And you saw some of the inequities. And I could tell a whole, point to a whole bunch of examples. The one that is probably the most extreme uh, in Senator Allen's district uh, is the city of Redondo Beach, uh, which is opposing this bill for reasons I do not understand, uh, because it will help with the inequity that they're experiencing. Redondo Beach was given a arena allocation of 1,397 uh, units. It's two neighboring cities that are not dramatically different in terms of population. Hermosa Beach and Manhattan Beach received allocations of two and 37, compared to 1,397. Uh, we also know that the city of Beverly Hills received arena allocation, again, this is all over an eight-year period, of three, three, one, two, three units over an eight-year period. Uh, so uh, SBA 28 will require a much more data-driven approach uh, and fewer politics. Right now, RENA allocates to each COG a blanket amount, and the COG then divvies up the numbers among individual cities. Uh, and that can become very politicized. That will end, or at least be dramatically reduced, with SB 828. I want to thank uh, the Bay Area Council and the Silicon Valley Leadership Group for co-sponsoring this bill. Um, and uh, testifying with me today are Cornelius Burke from the Bay Area Council and Michael Lane uh, of the Nonprofit Housing Association of Northern California, an umbrella organization for affordable housing creators and other advocates. Uh, so I respectfully ask for your I vote. Chairman Bell and members, uh, the legislature in various contexts has declared that affordable housing amount is a matter of statewide concern and not just local municipal affairs. In fact, the housing element is the only element in a local jurisdiction's general plan that must be certified by the state. We need to move from RENA being just a planning exercise to a production requirement. And we support SB 28 as RENA modernization and reform. The scarcity of properly zoned multifamily sites that are competitive for state affordable housing finance programs is a real problem. SB 28 addresses this by requiring the jurisdiction zone for more sites. This will put at least some downward pressure on skyrocketing land prices, and this is particularly important in the Bay Area, where land can go for $10 million or more, and it will also ensure that sufficient parcels are available for affordable housing development. There are three ingredients needed to develop affordable housing, land, funding, and the political will to get projects approved. The arena numbers that were generated in 2010 after the Great Recession were very low and didn't take into account the tech sector's boom, booming in the Bay Area, and that jobs ho uh, housing gap has continued to grow apace, and it was never foreseen by those numbers that were then given out uh, for targets uh, for housing in the Bay Area. SB 28 will begin to address that, particularly with the one-time statewide need assessment, I think is very important, with HCD oversight and the rollover of underproduction from one cycle to another for underperforming jurisdictions. We also think it is a good uh, best practice to have a buffer and, and to zone for more than just 100% of the arena uh, that has been allocated, and we urge your I vote. Um, thank you, Mr. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, Cornelius Burke with the Bay Area Council. We represent 300 of the top employers in the nine-county uh, Bay Area region. Um, we're at the epicenter of the housing crisis. The arena process is fundamentally flawed. Uh, SB 828 solves this problem. And it helps to address the housing problem. It creates a more data-driven, uh, objective approach to the arena number. Uh, respect for your acts, for your eye vote. Thank you. Other speakers. In Hicks, California's Alliance for Retired Americans. You have to turn and, Oops, sorry. Hey, how about that? He's got it. There we go. Randy Hicks, California Alliance for Retired Americans. Our local chapters of action teams from all over California report many frustrations where planning processes has for years misled us to believe that affordable housing to accommodate the number of seniors would be built. Then without fan for a public attention, the housing is not built, remaining in the plan, a false promise that jurisdictions does not deliver. Meanwhile, seniors and working people alike face rising house rising costs, health care crisis, and general decay in the particular employment sectors. Add the emergencies we've seen with wildfires, and we've seen displacement of these vulnerable populations, all the uh, two common outcome. They leave, suffer, uh, they leave and suffer the loss of family, friends, church, and community services we all hope they can enjoy. The intent of this legislation is to highlight communities where this deceit occurs with data and allocations of housing and targeted development could prove critical as we turn to the elected officials and planners for better solutions and 828 does just that. Thank you.
Other speakers in favor, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Keith Dunn on behalf of the California Apartment Association asking for your support. You. Yes, sir. And Luis Morante from California Ambient Support. Okay. Shepard representing the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, proudly uh, co sponsor of the bill, as well as the California Asian Pacific Islander Chamber Thank of you. Commerce in support. Emily Eichner on behalf of the California Building Industry Association in support. Okay. Tiffany Fan on behalf of Bridge Housing in support. Matthew Harger with the California Business Properties Association in support. Laura Curtis with the California Chamber of Commerce in support. Thank you. Uh, we have the uh, speakers uh, having concern or opposed. Come forward, please. Have, have a seat. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Bill Higgins from the California Association of Councils of Governments. And we appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today, and we appreciate the amendments that um, you have taken and appreciate your service on the MTC board when you were there as well. Um, and it's actually that service on MTC's board where they serve as an MPO and in charge of the Regional Transportation Plan. And the COG function here that I'm here to actually talk about, paragraph D in the comments of the analysis, uh, make a comment that it is entirely possible if you're asking the housing to be distributed according to an equity set of principles, that that distribution might be different than the distribution you would use to reach the maximum GHG reduction that you could get out of that when we model it. Sometimes those will correlate. A lot of times I think that they will not. My question is, is you've charged ARB with getting the maximum targets out of regional transportation plans. And you're starting to ask HCD to hit some equity performance metrics. What's going to happen when those two conflict? We need some kind of reconciliation. And there's a, 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 a bill on the assembly side where we're trying to work this out. And I would like to work with the senator to figure this out because I don't want to have my members in the situation where they are saying, we have to do this equity distribution to ARB. And ARB is saying, well, you're not going to achieve your target because you're right there on the edge. It's not going to happen in all instances, but I have to plan for that. And we need some kind of crosswalks for the state to talk in one policy principle. Two other really quick things about COGS and what they do. First of all, the arena is entirely unfunded by the state. It's expensive, there's a lot of modeling involved, and it's not funded. There's a commission of state mandates decision that says your COGS are not eligible, and it would be really nice if we're working on this and if you want us to do a better job that we figure out a funding resource for that. Second, um, there's limits to what we can do when we distribute the number to local agencies. We can't tell them where to put it. They have land use authority. We work with them. We're all, they're us. We work together. We figure it out. We try and plan and, and figure out a, a way to do it. But we can't make them do it if we're increasing 125 to 150%. Um, we're not sure where those units are going to go. And that, too, may affect the travel patterns in the community. We look forward to working with you. We appreciate the amendments. And um, I've talked to your staff. And I know that we'll be working uh, for the next few months. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sandy George representing the American Planning Association. Um, we've also been working cooperatively with your staff and we appreciate the time that they've spent with us. Um, we have a couple of major concerns with the bill itself as it's currently written. We appreciate the amendments. Uh, but we absolutely agree that the arena allocation process should be reviewed. Um, we're very concerned about some of the differences between the jurisdictions and how what their numbers are. Some are justified, some don't. It's not clear why they're different. But we do think that that allocation process should be fixed before additional changes are made to either the site requirements or the number of RENA um, units that are allocated uh, overall. Um, that really does hurt those jurisdictions that have more number, higher numbers now, and lets those that have fewer numbers get by with those fewer numbers in perpetuity. And we're really concerned about that being fixed, because if you have a requirement for 150% of sites that have to be rezoned, 
added to the current arena if you've got three housing units as opposed to 25,000 units that's a huge disparity that you cannot get back over time um, we're really really concerned about the impacts in those jurisdictions that took more housing and are trying hardest and I don't think that's the goal of the bill but that's exactly what will happen the same with the rollover and um, unmet need increases in the arena if you've got three and you currently have to uh, they only did two you have to add another two that's not a big deal again if you have 24,000 or more and you didn't weren't able to um, address all of those arena numbers mainly because there's not enough money in the state right now even with the bills from last year to pay for the subsidies that are needed for not only low and very low but for modern income in many jurisdictions you can't meet it this is going to set us up for failure so until that allocation process fixed we just can't agree to the other changes in the bill thank you thank you other speakers against good afternoon mr. chair Kira Ross on behalf of the city of San Marcos and the Marin County Council of Mayors and Council members both opposed okay Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members, Jason Ryan, Lee, California Cities. Um, we do not have an official position on this measure just yet. We've had conversations with the Senator. We're going to meet again later this week. Um, but we do have a couple concerns um, that haven't been addressed so far. And I'd just like to remind folks of the 15 bill package that went through last year. Um, one of the bills that went through that was really important is how we identify sites. If this bill is going to greatly increase the number of sites that we have to identify, it's going to be very difficult for us to identify those sites under the new process where we have to make sure that they're realistic and there's demonstrable potential for them to be redeveloped. Um, additionally, if those numbers, the arena numbers get too large, um, we're going to be caught in this perpetual cycle of having to do SB 35 in all of our communities because we can't possibly get um, to meet those, those numbers. And the reason why cities can't necessarily meet those numbers is because arena is not a production mandate. Cities do not build homes. We plan and we set the stage for development, and then developers come in and do that development. Without subsidies, you, uh, it's very difficult to develop those say, communities. Um, your name and what your position is. I got the League of Cities don't like it, so <laughs> Chris, I, 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 I've talked to him. Don't worry, I have. So I'm so of all of us. I think. Okay, just uh, who's there? Okay, your name. Chris Leo, on behalf of the California State Association of Counties. We also do not have an opposed position. We've shared our concerns with the bill and look forward to working with the author's office on improving those. But we share a lot of the concerns already identified by APA, the League, and CalCog. Yeah, okay. Tracy Ryan, Royal County Representatives of California with concerns as well. Thank you. Julian Divorce with the Urban Counties of California also with concerns. Okay. Jeff Tardigia, advocate. I'll say me too. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Susan Kirsch, representing Livable California, opposed to this bill. All right. Tom Weissmiller, individual, opposed the bill. All right. John Bechtel, this is a reckless mandate without water or infrastructure to support right, it. Yeah. Uh, Steve Scharf, City Council of Cupertino, representing only myself and 27,803 supporters of Better Cupertino. And I hope that there's a mandate to force developers to build the arena allocations that they're granted and the projects that are approved because they're not doing that now. Thank you. Jim Libby, oppose the bill. Julie Testa, resident, city of Pleasanton, and I represent tens of thousands of other residents who are concerned about this bill. We oppose the bill. Laurel and Borst, representing Citizen Marin, we urge you to oppose this bill. Mr. Chairman and members, Andrew Antwi here today on behalf of the city of Beverly Hills in opposition. And since uh, the city was cited uh, in the author's opening statement, I hope the committee might indulge just a short response. Uh, just to point out that the city of Beverly Hills population has remained relatively stable for the last 50 years. And uh, population growth in that projection is a big factor in uh, the renal process. Also, we're a fairly landlocked city. Um, and so those are two driving factors in the process and so uh, we did have relatively low arena targets also the land value for units in the city of Beverly Hills is drastically high and in many cases the city uh, cities like Beverly Hills would like to coordinate with their name? neighbors what was your name please? Andrew Antwi okay thank you <laughs> <laughs> we oppose the bill 
There we go. I got it. Thank you. Beverly Hills. Okay. Coalition to Preserve LA, Ilana Wachtel, we oppose the bill. Okay. Okay. Jorge Castaneda, uh, Committee to Defend Roosevelt, Los Angeles Tenants Union, Eastside, strongly oppose. And Christy Foy with the City of Redondo Beach, opposed to the bill. Rick Hall, San Francisco, Mission Anti-Gentrification Activist, opposed the bill. Mailing Stefan uh, from Sunnyvale, my neighbors encouraged me to come to express our opposition to a one-size-fits-all bill that does not address the real problems of inequities. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, just uh, just a, a discussion on, uh, you know, first of all, regional, regional planning issues uh, in general. Uh, the, Having, having um, been on the Metropolitan Transportation Commission for 22 years and chairing the commission as well, um, I think that you can fairly say that uh, the transportation planning, the, um, the funding of transportation um, is uh, pretty robust in terms of uh, the way we work in California. However, the other side of it is the housing part is not, I think it's very clear from the COGS and from other people and from Senator Wiener's bill and others that the funding of the planning and the implementation of the planning um, through uh, RENA and uh, local general plans is not robust and it's not, um, it's not uh, effective, I would say. I would honestly say that it's not effective. So we have to have uh, some kind of um, connection that increases the ability to do good planning. And if we want to do that, it's going to take some money. So that's the first thing I want to say. So when we talk about uh, housing legislation, just like when we talked about SB1 uh, last year. In SB1, we added money for planning we had money for planning so the local planning organizations could do a better job planning the transportation facilities. I think we have to add money for the local housing, regional housing organizations, and including the, some of the cities, the smaller cities especially, uh, to help them uh, do a good job on uh, planning uh, for, for the housing requirements in their general plan. Uh, general plans, um, just a comment on general plans. Yes, general plans are a conflict-ridden document. I think when, when people uh, invented the idea of general plans, it was to replace uh, quote-unquote zoning because people felt zoning was uh, uh, not done on a, um, uh, a real plan basis and uh, there was no idea of how you can determine how many parks, how many schools, uh, what kind of transit, transportation facilities, what kind of services a community could have. So they, they developed this idea of the general plan. And since that was um, created, I think it's done a pretty good job in developing planning for most other things, land use, how, you know, uh, parks and Recreation somewhat uh, later it started to get better in terms of planning schools but it's never really done a really good job on planning the housing and I think that's uh, another thing that um, we need to work on enforcing and creating better planning for the housing supply so I'm, I'm willing to work in the context of the regional planning and the local planning to improve uh, the goals and implementation of the goals for more housing in, in the various communities. And I think we all, we all should agree with that. So we can beef up the regional plans and we can beef up the local plans by um, working on this bill. This bill has generally a, a pretty good direction from my opinion, um, but I think it needs to have some, some other things where there's some conflicts uh, and, and, and things that need to be cleared up. And I'm going to, Senator Wiener's agreed to work with me 
between now and the Appropriations Committee to uh, kind of do those kinds of things that were mentioned in the staff report specifically. So um, I'd like to invite other speakers, other thoughts from members, Senator Allen, Senator Canella, senators, and maybe Senator Weiner can comment on this. Okay, I'm struggling with this bill a bit because uh, last year, you know, you and I had spoken, Senator, about trying to fix some of these enormous inequities in Rena, and I was hoping that that would be what would happen with this bill. I think that my understanding of the issue that Redondo Beach has is that is, is precisely what you just described, the fact that they have such a higher allocation than their neighboring cities. Uh, we're basically doubling down on that formula by forcing, uh, you know, by, by sort of taking the existing allocations. I understand we're not doubling them anymore. We're now doing 125 percent. But then we're adding in this rollover aspect that, uh, that basically will penalize them for not meeting the, the targets before. And I, you know, I, I do think we need to get more aggressive with our cities about this, but I do think that there's an, an, a basic equity issue here because they, because they uh, had such a, such a high arena burden, you can understand why they would be concerned about anything that doubles down on the existing arena numbers, as your bill seems to do. I, I may be confused, but that's my understanding of why Redondo Beach is so opposed. It's because of the fact that they were, uh, that, there, that there's such a disparity between their allocation and their neighboring cities' allocations. The question that um, Senator um, Allen raised, or? Sure. You want to hear them all? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm happy to. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Senator Allen, who uh, 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 I, th I believe said in the comments around SBA 27 last week that the that the right approach to housing was the SB 35 approach to say that if you meet your goals, you're all good. If you don't meet your goals, you're, we're going to help you meet your goals uh, by expediting and streamlining the approval process, which is what SB 35 does. Uh, but of course, if RENA is out of whack, which it is, that means that it's not going to be, you're not going to really have the best possible uh, result. Uh, and the Redondo Beach situation is a situation where RENA shows how RENA is out of whack. Uh, in terms of the rollover, uh, we're happy to have conversations about what that means. If you have a city that has a really out of whack, excuse my jargon, but out of whack RENA, either high or low, what, what that means. That's a, that's, that's a fair point if for, the, for the truly outlier cities. And the question is, it may be that Redondo Beach's number was the right number and Manhattan and Hermosa Beach were the ones that were out of whack, or maybe vice versa. Uh, and that's something that we can certainly take a look at uh, in the bill, because if it's really clear that, that a city got an allocation that was just really bizarrely large based on nothing, why, we can take that into account. Um, you but, don't know uh, until you find out. But, yeah, so what you, you don't know what the reason is. Right. Well, the reason we know we can find out. The re yeah. The reason is often political, just to be honest. Um, well, we can't say that until we look into it. So yeah. that's what I'm saying. Um, I mean, everything's political, I think. You know, so you know, we all know that. But but I think the reason that they got the 25 versus the other one getting, you know, uh, three or whatever it was. Um, there might be some explanation, but there might not be in a logical frame. So I think the point that Senator Weiner has is to set up some some logic behind it, correct? Yeah. I mean, that's the goal, is to create some kind of real logic and fairness right. and equity. We're, absolutely, Mr. Chairman. And we're, we're trying to uh, make what is a very problematic process, RENA, a more coherent, data-driven process. Now, when you're starting out from a structure that, that has some issues, you know, you're, you're never going to be able to perfect it, and you're building off of trying to fix the foundation, but it's a challenging thing to do. It's never going to be perfect, but this bill will move us in a very positive direction on RENA, uh, and it will also help us to actually take into account our full housing needs, uh, which RENA really uh, doesn't always do uh, right now. Yay. But, it's, but I, I, as you've heard, we've been working with a lot of different 
stakeholders, and we're going to continue to do that. The bill is absolutely uh, a work in progress. Well, I, I guess my concern is that that I, I was hoping that there would be a, a kind of already a more comprehensive approach to to rethinking RENA, and and I guess my concern is that that. I understand bills are works in progress, but it seems as though your approach so far has been to double down on a lot of aspects of the current allocation system as it exists that we've all agreed is a little screwy. I, so that's my essential concern here. Uh, the goal, Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, is to... Uh is to make sure that communities are getting uh, realistic allocations that reflect population growth, job growth, housing needs. That, that's the goal, which is not always happening right now. So ultimately, we want to have real housing goals um, so that we get to a point uh, where we don't have, you know, 15,000 youth living on the street and people living in their cars and families leaving places like San Francisco and Santa Monica and Cupertino uh, because there's nowhere for them to live. That, that's, that's the goal. And we're open to any ideas that people have. Um, we're, we're absolutely extremely open to ideas, including uh, what Senator Allen just mentioned about that specific issue in his district and other issues as well. But we think the bill is a really solid uh, foundation to having uh, a better system of setting housing goals uh, for California. Um, Mr. Chairman, if I may, I do just want to, there was an interesting uh, a couple of comments that I, I want to just mention. Uh, we heard from the League of Cities that cities don't build housing, and we hear that a lot. And of course, cities, for the most part, don't physically build housing. But what cities do, do of course, uh, is allow other people to build housing or prevent other people from building housing. And the problem that we have, there are a number of them, but one of the problems is not that the cities are not themselves becoming developers, which they generally aren't, but that cities are stopping other people from building housing. They're doing it in many ways, and we all know what they are, making it really hard or impossible to build housing. So cities can, do not build the housing themselves, but cities can either make it much easier or much harder for other people to create uh, housing. And in fact, we heard that from the Council of Governments, the representative of the statewide COG Association said, hey, we can't force the cities, the cities control land use, we can't force them to build housing. And then the cities say, well, we control land use, but we don't build housing. So it ends up the can gets kicked around and then we just don't have enough housing. And so we want to just make sure we're setting good housing goals. And I fully support more money for planning. Uh, we did that last year, and I'm a big, especially for our smaller cities that don't have big planning departments, I'm a thousand percent in support of supporting them financially uh, to help them plan. I, I believe I neglected to point out that SB2 had money for planning. That was Senator Atkins' bill. She specifically put money in for development of housing plans. So, so SB1 and SB2 both had additional beefed up planning. I think. I think those, that's a critical element in terms of accomplishing something here. So Sarah Allen, you had some more questions. Yeah, so I guess building on what you just said, if the local governments are being intransigent on this issue, then, and, and you know, the chair talked about the, pol the politicization of this process when it comes to allocation, um, are, you know, we're, aren't we sort of doubling down once again on the local governments? I mean, you have the COGS making these decisions who are basically made up of local governments. Would it not be better to have, I don't know, some, I mean, I know a lot of people here aren't going to like this, but some sort of state agency that would look at the, uh, at, at these issues more holistically as opposed to, I mean, I, I kind of worry that the model you've structured is, is just, it, it's, it, it doesn't extract itself from the political phenomena that you're seeking to address. We had that last week, and it was voted down. So there are ways for the state. There are other ways to this guy to roll, and yeah. and we're open to those ideas. But this is about one specific issue. So one of the reasons why I think sometimes people hesitate to do. Um, and and the difference between what I'm suggesting and what you had last week is that week 27 was a was was, was as opposed to having some kind of agency look 
at a thoughtful approach around the state and look at the circumstances of every community, it created a one-size-fits-all approach to development in... Yeah. It actually did not, but we can have that conversation separately. That was a talking point that was not accurate. But putting that aside, um, you know, this is the state through the COGS setting housing goals. But the COGS are made of local community. governments. They are. And they're it's given... Very governments and they're, right. the state gives them the numbers, and that's what's allocated to the state. You guys state. want to go have a cup of coffee somewhere? <laughs> 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 uh, okay, so... Where we are with the bill is we're recommending the bill to be approved with some amendments that <coughs> specifically address some of the concerns that we heard today. Not all of them, but there's some other concerns. Senator Weiner has agreed to work with me and anybody else that wants to address these issues, and they're all listed in our staff report. And, and we're going to work with the COGS, the League of Cities, and the counties, and other interested uh, housing advocates. Um, uh, to get a bill, um, intending to get a bill that will be developed uh, through the Appropriations Committee and to the floor of the Senate, hopefully. That's the, the glide path that we're on with this bill. So that's the plan. If you want to accept that plan, that's, you know, I, I, I personally think that um, the bill with beefed up good solid planning gives people no excuses not to come up with some good planning for housing. I think we can do that. It can get, we, 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 we will not have any more excuses. There will be conflicts between environmental goals and housing goals. Those are things that the COGS and the, the municipalities, if they have sophisticated good planning, can work out. Big, and, and, I, and I don't broad brush Cities. I don't say all the cities are bad. They don't do the housing. That's not. That's not even a relevant comment, in my opinion, because we have we have all these different actors, and some of them do a pretty good job. Others traditionally haven't done a good job. And uh, but I think if we had some consistent planning, consistent standards, that's what the senators trying to achieve. I will support that because I think that gives us. Um, an even playing field for all the cities to consider, in my opinion. That's, that's, uh, I think it's a fair way of dealing with this issue. So um, that's, that's kind of my, my um, effort to work something on this uh, with the senator and the, and the COGS and the other organizations. So I think they can do it if we, if we all work together. Senator? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a question for the League of Cities. Uh, you're not listed in opposition, but it sounded like you were opposing the bill. What exactly is your position? Yeah, you can come up. And, yeah. So, yeah, Jay, Senator Weiner, Senator Weiner, would you mind scooting over just a little bit? I'm sorry. I, yeah, there you, go. you were distracting me last time as well. Yeah. Uh, Senator Canelli, yeah, Jason Ryan, League of California Cities. Uh, we do not have an official position. We, you know, committed to the author to meet a couple times to work out some of our of our differences. Um, we certainly share many of the concerns that, that have been uh, mentioned. Um, I think the methodology is something that perhaps, you know, this Senator Bells would mention that, that we can get there, you know, uh, maybe a better allocation of, of numbers. They do seem a little bit um, out of the ordinary, but when it comes to, you know, doubling down on what we ha the underperformance over the years. You sound like comments in opposition. So why aren't you in opposition? Why are, why are you neutral on this bill? This is a big bill, important to communities. It's just yeah. interesting that you would not take a formal position. Yeah, no, it is a very big bill, and we're taking it very seriously. I think the, the main reason why we're not in opposition is because the senator asked to, to work with us. and we Okay, thank you. Senator McGuire. Thank you so much. I'm going to deal with uh, three specific issues, uh, Senator Weiner, and I'm not going to rehash last week. So... Um, First of all, uh, and one is a comment and not a question. Um, I, I think it's important uh, and have had several conversations with individuals on city councils uh, within the North Bay uh, that the amendment uh, that uh, both senators have worked through with the chair and Senator Weiner is replacing shall with should uh, to do away with the unintended mandate to ensure future housing production has been met. Um, and I think that is a, a significant amendment for local governments, candidly. The, uh, the, and that's where I've heard a lot of concerns uh, from local governments. 
on developed areas. I know that you were having a conversation earlier about developed areas. Uh, and I also know this is a work in progress. One of the items obviously want to uh, avoid, and I know that I don't want to put words into the senator's mouth, but I'm sure he wants to avoid, and particularly unincorporated communities are non uh, are in non-developed or small communities in unincorporated areas. So one of the areas, I know that you're going to be working with COGS, Legacy City, CSAC, RCRC as well, but looking at those priority development areas, like for example in the county of Sonoma, for example, on the Board of Supervisors, that have already been identified, uh, that are unincorporated communities that are connected somewhat to transit or connected completely with a rail line, that could be uh, potentially a focus uh, for those priority developed areas. Uh, and that's candidly where the vast majority of unincorporated um, County unincorporated urbanized areas, yeah, like so, Sacramento and your county. Yeah. So I, anyway, county. as you go forward, um, assuming is I think that's an area that will need to be uh, focused in on and not sprawling out right uh, within other areas. I'm. Uh, I know you're. Uh, I don't. Li I don't like sprawl. Yeah. So I'm. I'm all. I'm. I'm all for avoiding sprawl. And and that's why I just want to bring it up and not trying to put any words in the mouth, but I just. Uh, making sure. Um, and I think the other piece is, um, and it was a significant amendment, uh, again, going from uh, down from 200%. So uh, not at all trying to rehash what you've already discussed, um, but I think that the important piece of, of this is focusing on what those affordable housing goals are, understanding they're moving the needle, um, and the shall to should. Um, and I think that's important, and that's why I'm going to be supporting the bill today. Senator Allen, you had some more questions, right? Go ahead. No, he has more questions. Well, I, I just want to clarify yeah, that what I was you. suggesting was having a state approach that would actually look, that would look specifically at the various issues that have been raised in the bill um, and, and then allocates out the, the arena numbers as opposed to having the COGS do it. I... I would be happy to sit down with you and talk through that. I, I suspect that there are some people in this room who might not like that, but um, that's, that's a, a reasonable idea to discuss. Um, I, think, uh, I think part of the goal of this, because what we've done in the past, and I think you're absolutely right, is we just say to each COG, this is your overall number, do with it as you will, and then some of these odd results end up happening, and inequitable results sometimes have to do with incomes of communities or who has the most political clout. Uh, and the goal of the bill is to put more guardrails around what the COGS do in, in saying, okay, state, you gave us, let's just say, a million homes. I'm just making that number up. Uh, instead of saying, COG, you, you allocate the million homes how you want, the pur purpose of the bill is to place stronger standards and guardrails so that as they're allocating it, they're doing it based on an actual methodology and not just based on who, you know, carries the biggest stick or whatever. Um, if there are better ways of doing that, we're absolutely open to those ideas. I think we probably share the same goal in just having the non-randomness of the COGS doing, um, or having the, we want to avoid the randomness of the COGS doing whatever they want. I'm not insulting the COGS. I was part of one. Um, the, the arena process is a really difficult one. Everyone is in a difficult position. The COGS are in a difficult position. The cities are. It's so much pushing and pulling. No one's bad. No one's good. Everyone's just trying to do their job. But we, I think we can set up a better structure, and that's what we're trying to do. If there are other ideas, we are absolutely want to hear them. So... Um, Senator, Senator uh, Canella, did you have a comment? Uh, Senator Wick, uh, Senator... Uh, well, one last item. I, I think this understanding process as we move forward, because I think it's going to be important involving local government, cities, counties, COGS, who are going to be uh, focused and impacted on the legislation. Can you just lay out and your thoughts and also would like to be able to ask Senator Wiener the same thing about what does the process look like as far as bringing definition to the bill um, and how that you see this roll out over the next few weeks? Well, I think, you, you know, as we all know, Housing has been kind of the um, weak part of the planning process in regional planning, I would say. It hasn't had the strength and the attention that transportation, 
planning and the transportation planning has had money so that attract a lot of interest of course you know what kind of projects you're going to get you know fighting for the projects and doing that but the housing and the land use planning part has not had um, emphasis I would say in California planning and my purpose in working with Senator Weiner is to actually make the COGS have a more relevant, clear planning process that can produce, working with the cities, more affordable housing in California, meeting our housing goals, creating an opportunity for our state to recover from the housing deficit that we have, uh, creating the opportunity to see some logic behind financing housing and if the public can see that we have a good planning process, a good um, a way of fairly uh, determining where the housing should be built and, and planned, I think the public will have much more support for um, the affordable housing that's built in California. And I think part of the problem is we don't want to create a situation where um, it's a uh, monster political issue that creates backlash and, you know, constant, um, you know, waves of different kinds of legislation over the years. We want to create a logical, clear uh, pr process so everybody can feel comfortable, no matter what part of the state they're in. You know, it could be, I obviously know that San Francisco is... Um, a different type of place than San Jose. I think happens to think San Jose is a much better place, but uh, <laughs> uh, San Francisco is a nice place too. So we're sister, we're sister cities, and, and yeah, we're yeah we're sister cities. But uh, so, but San, San Jose uh, has different kinds of planning issues than San Francisco. Like you pointed out, Santa Rosa, Healdsburg. There's different sizes, and and then we have cities that had grown real fast. And then we have cities that don't grow at all. We have different types of communities. Uh, you know, I hate to admit it, but the man from Beverly Hills pointed out that that city hasn't grown at all. And uh, so San Jose grows quite, quite rapidly over the last 30 years. And several other cities and other communities in California. So, so I think we have to genuinely you know, not be, um, I would say, um, broad brushing this too much. If we broad brush it too much, then we're, we'll not achieve what we're trying to achieve here, okay, which is to get more housing. We're not going to achieve it. We have to be, we have to be a little more sophisticated in our, in our approach, I think, and, and look at the individual areas and respond to that to see what we can do to get the best opportunity for housing in each one of those areas. So that takes a lot of planning, a lot of work, and uh, money. Yeah, um, I appreciate that. And, uh, please, Senator Weiner, I just have a real quick comment after Senator Weiner. Th thank you, uh, and through the chair, um, Senator McGrath, thank you for that. I, I think one thing you'll, uh, a theme in all the bills I had today, including the lactation one, we, might, we have an open door and we meet with people who agree with us, don't agree with us, and we take feedback from people who don't agree, even if it's, uh, if it's good. Um, I want to actually, I, I, I've had my disagreements with the League of Cities. I want to actually thank the League of Cities for not coming out quickly and opposing the bill. We sat down uh, with the League early, and I said, you have my commitment that we'll work with you. Uh, and um, we're doing that, and we will do that. And I'm very appreciative that they haven't uh, quickly come out uh, in opposition. And we're going to continue not just through appropriations, but I'm sure uh, if things go well, then through the assembly, uh, we'll be continuing to work with stakeholders, and, and I look forward to that process. Rena is really important. It's a, uh, it gets beat up a lot, including by me, because it has problems, uh, but we're going to, I hope, make it better, uh, and it's going to take uh, a lot of smart people to help make that happen. No, I appreciate that. And so uh, my, my last item is, so what it sounds like is that the two of you will be meeting with each of the respected groups who may potentially be impacted by this, right? No, I think I'm going to involve all the centers in this committee on the, in the discussion, Senator. So no, that's I right. want to involve everybody because I think there's, there's a heightened interest right now and we ought to get together and 
make sure it's something we can commit to ourselves and perhaps per, perhaps unify. Yeah. Yes, sir. And I'll just finish as yeah, uh, Mr. Vidak is ready to move the bill. Uh, is that uh, I appreciate taking into account what may work in a large metropolitan area. That's to say, over five hundred thousand. It may. It's going to be different for those communities that are between ten thousand and twenty-five thousand, for example. And through the chair, uh, I think that I mean, I guarantee you, if we took the reallocation today for Healdsburg versus San Francisco, they're in different universes. So one of the things about Rena is, it, in some ways, especially Based once we make it, community. once we fix it, it smaller cities are go do get smaller allocations. You're not Healdsburg is not going to get you know a hundred thousand hundred thousand home. Allocation. San Francisco is not going to get a 200 home right. allocation. There's also some secret sauce in there that I think all of us aren't exactly sure how they developed the formula. Uh, but um, I, I will no. share with you that criticism. But again, allowing you to continue to work on this issue, um, we'll be supporting it. Obviously, want to be able to see what that final result is. Result will be uh, prior to get on the floor. But I appreciate you tackling this and working with the chair as well. And we'll be supportive. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Senator Gaines. You have a comment, Senator? Yeah, I, um Thank you, Senator Weiner. If you could just um, help me a little bit in terms of uh, housing element, because I know these are estimates that are made by municipalities, but it's, it seems like the market conditions have to be just right, too. Uh, you've got to have um, interest rates. Uh, the economy needs to be growing, I, I think. Uh, you've got to have um, a lot of market-driven um, mechanisms in place in order to satisfy a Reno requirement and so I'm wondering if maybe you could just respond to that uh, the building industry is in support but I mean these are basically just estimates that may or may not be adhered to based on what's happening within the marketplace yeah so um, you need two things you need the economic strength for the uh, for the privately produced housing and then you need public funding uh, for the uh, lower income uh, housing and, and both are important elements uh, and we do have um, support from the construction industry we also have support um, from nonprofit affordable housing uh, developers as well so it's a, a nice a nice pairing uh, and the way you know of course the way it works is the arena numbers come out and then as um, communities are going through their housing element process they have to zone or identify in their housing element and ultimately zone for whatever the arena is, and we're now saying it should be a little higher than the arena uh, because it doesn't always pan out on every parcel. Uh, and yes, there are there are times when you know if the, if the economy tanks, uh, you will see a drop in production, and that's beyond anyone's control. Uh, but then, when the economy accelerates, uh, if communities are allowing the, the housing to be built, it, it tends to get built. And in communities where, for whatever reason, developers or affordable house developers are not interested in building, um, then even if they don't meet the arena, it's, if no one's going to build, no one's going to build. And so there's some things we can't control. And arena, uh, you know, I, w I wish we could, you know, really just perf have perfect housing delivery on everything. It's, as you know, life is too complicated for that. Uh, but, but what we can control is having really good housing goals uh, so that we can get on a better path. So those can be adjusted based on the market conditions, is what. Well, well it's every eight years. Eight years. Yeah. Every eight years, typically, uh, it's done, and uh, uh, you know, using. And again, right now, every council of government they have their own. Sometimes they do it their own way, um, and so it does not even complete consistency across the state. We're just trying to make it a little more consistent. Okay. It's not perfect. I'm not. I'm never going to claim it's perfect. Thank you. Other questions from other senators? We have a motion on the floor. Senator, would you like to close? Uh, colleagues, thank you. This, I really appreciate the thoughtful discussion, and I respectfully ask for your eye vote. Call the roll. This is Senate Bill 828 by Senator Weiner. The motion is due pass as amended and will refer to the Committee on Appropriations. Senator Bell? Aye. Bell I. Canella? Aye. Canella I. Allen? Dodd? Aye. Dodd I. Gaines? Aye. Gaines I. Galgiani? McGuire? Aye. McGuire I. Morell? Roth? Skinner? Aye. Skinner, aye. Vidak? Aye. Vidak, aye. Wachowski? Wiener? Aye. Wiener, aye. Eight. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Eight. We have eight votes in favor. We'll leave the roll, Senator. Perhaps a member of Senator Skinner is here. Welcome, Senator, to the Transportation and Housing Committee. We've all been busy. 
including you, and you have you have three bills, and then Senator, um, we are co-presenting um, item three. So, uh, if it's your pleasure, you could present your bill, and then we'll go to the 